No, I will not talk about the trailer for the new Ghostbusters film, only because the trailer does not outright tell how good a film will be. I will link you to The Phantom Menace, The Last Airbender, Max Payne, and the Fantastic Four trailer as my evidence. What I'm here to talk about today is what made the original Ghostbusters the hit it was and still is. We came, we saw, we kicked its ass! And what the new film will have to do in order to meet the expectations and filmmaking prowess the original has. Incredible. The original Ghostbusters is one of the most beloved comedies ever. And it's a science fiction film. My own father, who abhors science fiction, loves Ghostbusters. It hit a very wide audience, and that's great for both the studio and, well, filmmaking. This happened to you before? So, let's call this my eight reasons the original Ghostbusters worked. Why eight? Honestly, I, I couldn't limit it to five, and I couldn't find ten, so here we go. Number one. It's great science fiction. Not only is Ghostbusters an excellent comedy, it's also a very well done science fiction film. There's techno babble galore with Egon and Ray. Talk about telekinetic activity, look at this mess! A full torso apparition, and it's real. If the ionization rate is constant for all ectoplasmic entities, we could really bust some heads. In a spiritual sense, of course. And with good science fiction, you understand the rules of the universe. For example, Star Wars. Only Jedi can use the Force, but the Force is in all living things. Lord of the Rings. The ring hides you when you wear it, but Sauron can see you. Ghostbusters. Don't cross the streams, or... Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total protonic reversal. Which, that is just one example from the film on how it builds its universe. Kudos to the writers who actually cared. Number two. God damn it, Bill fucking Murray! You may think I'm just saying that because... I mean, it's Bill Murray. But no, he was in the peak of his career when this film came out. No matter what he is doing in the film, you can feel his authenticity through the screen. He's kind of a proxy for the audience. I've always wanted to do this. And the flowers are still standing. Among all of the insanity that happens on screen, he stands with a smirk on his face, kind of letting the audience know, it's okay to laugh, it's kind of ridiculous. Look how he contrasts from Ray upon exiting the elevator. It's hilarious! I die every time I see his saunter counter Ray's combat ready position. Which leads to my next point. Great character building. We understand how everyone in this movie reacts to one another and the environment around them. We first meet Peter Bakeman doing an ESP session, totally messing with the guy whilst flirting incessantly with the woman. It totally embodies his character. Lighthearted, sarcastic, but still doing his job. Yes, it's true. This man has no dick. When we first see Egon, he's studiously looking at a table trying to get readings. His stern face and monotone voice scream volumes about how serious he is about his work. I collect spores, molds, and fungus. Ray is an eager, super enthusiastic dork who's kind of an airhead sometimes. Wow! This place is great! When can we move in? You gotta try this pole! And Winston. Uh... Sadly, he's the most underdeveloped character here. He pretty much just says that he wants a job, and he gets the job. It's the 80s. We still had time to progress. With all of these attributes they have, we see how they function together, and it feels completely organic. Nothing feels forced. Now, I know there are more characters like Janine, Dana, but I'll get to them. Especially Janine. Am I wrong for feeling Janine is completely smoking hot? I mean, her droll, dry, deadpan sense of humor with her short hair and glasses and... You know how love was meant to be. I'll stop. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. You know, this. Number four, the antagonists, or in this case, assholes. When they want you to dislike a character, they make you dislike a character. The college dean who kicks them out is even a complete prick. Your theories are the worst kind of popular tripe. Your methods are sloppy and your conclusions are highly questionable. You are a poor scientist, Dr. And he's just in this one scene, but you still want to sock him one right in his dumb mouth face. And then there is Walter Peck. Look at the guy. They even made him the asshole in Die Hard and Die Hard 2. This guy's career is about being an asshole, but hey, I guess it's work. These characters make you want the protagonist to win even more. The opposition the protagonists face and them conquering said opposition makes you feel 
by proxy, like you've overcome something as well, even if you didn't get to punch Walter in the face. But he does get covered in goop in the end, so there's that. Number five, the side characters. Dana and Lewis play a huge part in this film as well, and they have great qualities to them. Lewis is a timid, dorky, tryhard, hopeless romantic who has the hots for Dana, but you can tell his heart is in the right place. Dana is a single musician who gets possessed. There is no Dana, only It was the 80s, not all the characters were going to be that well thought out. But she does become Ripley later on in her career, so... Yay, feminism! Number 6, Practical Effects. Now I know, practical effects do not make a film great, nor is an overuse of CGI, but a good implementation of both can make you feel more immersed in a film, like Mad Max, Terminator 2, and the original Star Wars films. The film has great stuff to admire, and the craft and effort is hard to go unnoticed. Look at these eggs! You see these eggs? I'm, I'm blown away by these eggs, Al. I'm blown away by these eggs every time I look at them. Just a pop. How, how do they do that? How? You know? I don't know. Tell me. Number seven, this moment. Okay, so when I was like nine and saw this movie, I refused to sit on this one chair in my living room. It terrified me. I thought that was going to happen to me. This kind of connects back to the good science fiction remark, but it's still worth mentioning that it's okay to try and scare your audience sometimes. And number eight, setup and payoff. This film sets up moments early on in the film that have a huge payoff later. I will mention two of them specifically. Don't cross the streams. We are alerted of the danger that could come up if they were to do this act. They could die. It's completely probable. At the end of the film, they risk their lives doing this maneuver, and the victory is that much sweeter in the end. This statue shot, it's ominous and foreboding. It seems like it's just there for no reason at all at first. But then, after a brief moment that we go back with Dana and Lewis, we cut back to see if the statues are gone. Again, it's ominous, but it works to keep the intrigue levels at maximum. Ghostbusters is beloved for a lot of reasons. Whether you like it for the comedy, the filmmaking, the Bill Murray. Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Janine. Or any of the reasons I mentioned, there's not a doubt that this film is a deserved classic. And the new one, with mostly SNL cast members, seems to have some parallels in their design. But I can't entirely put my finger on it. And I'll go off and say I adore these actresses who are in the new film. They are hilarious. I've seen them all on SNL, especially Kate McKinnon and Kristen Wiig. They're some of my favorites. And like I said at the beginning, we can't fully judge a film until it comes out. A trailer truly means nothing in the end. I'm Brandon Groby, and as always, thanks for watching. And hey, subscribe while you're at it.